Economic Growth and Income Inequality, a paper written by Simon Kuznets, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1971. This is his seminal paper at the American Economic Review in 1955. So, economic growth and income inequality. The central theme of this paper is the character and causes of long-term changes in the personal distribution of income. Does in inequality in the distribution of income increase or decrease in the course of a country's economic growth? What factors determine the secular level and trends of income inequalities? These are broad questions in a field of study that has been plagued by looseness in definitions, unusual scarcity of data, and pressures of strongly held opinions. While we cannot completely avoid the resulting difficulties, it may help to specify the characteristics of the size of income distributions that we want to examine and the moments of which we want to explain. Five, five specific questions may be listed. First, the units for which incomes are recorded and grouped should be family expenditure units, properly adjusted for the number of persons in each rather than income recipient for whom the relations between receipts and use of income can be widely diverse. Second, the distribution should be complete, i.e. should cover all units in a country rather than a segment, either at the upper or lower tail. Third, if possible, we should segregate the units whose main income earners are either still in the learning or already in the retired stages of their life cycle to avoid complicating the picture by including incomes not associated with full-time, full-fledged participation in economic activity. Fourth, income should be defined as it is now for national income in this country, i.e. received by individuals, including income in kind, before and after direct taxes, excluding capital gains. Fifth, the units should be grouped by secular levels of income, free of cyclical and other transient disturbances. For such a distribution of mature expenditure units by secular levels, of income per capita, we should measure shares of in uh, some fixed ordinal groups, percentiles, deciles, quintiles, etc. In the underlying array, the units should be classified by average income levels for a sufficiently long span so that they form income status groups, say a generation or about 25 years. Within such a period, even when classified by secular income levels, units may shift from one ordinal group to another. It would, therefore, be necessary and useful to study separately the re relative share of units that, throughout the generation period of reference, were continuously within a specific ordinal group and the share of the units that moved into that specific group. And this should be done for the share of residents and migrants within all ordinal groups without such a long period of reference and the resulting separation between resident and migrant units at different relative income levels. The very distinction between low and high income classes loses its meaning, particularly in a study of long-term changes in shares and in inequalities in the distribution. To say, for example, that the lower income classes gained or lost during this last 20 years in that their share, uh, in that their share of total income increased or decreased has meaning only if 
the units have been classified as members of the lower classes throughout those 20 years. And for those who have moved into or out of the classes recently, such a statement has no significance. Furthermore, if one may add a final touch to that is beginning to look like a statistical economist's pipe dream, we should be able to trace secular income levels not only through a single generation, but at least through two connecting the incomes of a given generation with those of its immediate descendants. We could then distinguish units that throughout a given generation remain within one ordinal group and whose children through their generation are also within that group from units that remain within a group through their generation but those but whose children move up or down on the relative economic scale in their time the number of possible combinations and permutations becomes large but it should not obscure the main design of the income structure called for the classification by long-term income status of a given generation and of its immediate descendants. If living members of society as procedures, consumers, saviors, decision makers on secular problems react to long-term changes in income level, uh, levels and shares, data on such an income structure are essential. An economic society can then be judged by the secular level of the income share that it provides for a given generation and for its children. The important corollary is that the study of long-term changes in the income distribution must distinguish between changes in the shares of resident groups. Residents within either one or two generations and changes in the income shares of groups that judged by their secular levels migrate toward up, uh, uh, upward or downward on the income scale. Even if we had data to approximate the income structure just outlined the broad question posed at the start how income inequality changes in the process of a country's economic growth could be answered only for growth under defined economic and social conditions. And in fact, we shall deal with this question in terms of the experience of now developed countries, which, uh, which grew under the aegis of the business enterprise. But even with this limitation, there are no statistic, statistics that can be used directly for the purpose of measuring the secular income structure. Indeed, I have difficulty in visualizing how such information could practically be collected, a difficulty that may be due to lack of familiarity with the studies of our colleagues in demography and sociology to have concerned themselves with problems of generation or intergeneration mobility and status. But although we now lack data directly relevant to the secular income structure, the setting up of reasonably clear and yet difficult specifications is not merely an exercise in perfectionism. For if these specifications do approximate, and I trust that they do, the real core of our interest when we talk about shares of economic classes or long-term changes in these shares, then proper disclosure of our meaning and intention is vitally useful. <clears throat> it forces us to examine and evaluate critically the data that are available. It prevents us from jumping to conclusions based on these inadequate data. It reduces the loss and waste of time involved in mechanical manipulations of the type represented by Pareto curve fitting to 
groups of data whose meaning in terms of income concept, unit of observation, and pro uh, proportion of the total universe covered remains distressingly vague. And most important of all, it propels us toward a deliberate constructions, construction of testable bridges between the available data and the income structure that is the real focus of our interest. One, trends in income inequality. Forewarned of the difficulties, we turn now to the available data. These data, even when re relating to complete populations, invariably classify units by income for a given year. From our standpoint, this is their major limitation because the data often do not permit many size groups, groupings, and because the difference between annual income incidence and the longer term income status has had, has little effect, less effect if the number of classes is small and the limits of each class are wide. We use a few wide classes. This does not so resolve the difficulty. And there are others due to the scantiness of data for long periods, inadequately of the unit used, which is at best a family and very often a reporting unit, errors in the data and so on through a long list. Consequently, a trend, the trends in the income structure can be discerned but dimly, and the results considered as preliminary informed guesses. The data are for the United States, England, and Germany. A scant sample, but at least a starting point for some inferences concerning long-term changes in the presently developed countries. The general conclusion suggested is that the relative distribution of income as measured by annual income incidence in rather broad classes has been moving toward equality. With these trends particularly noticeable since the 1920s, but beginning perhaps in the period before the First World War. Let me cite some figures. All for income before direct taxes in support of this impression. In the United States, in the distribution of income among families, including single individuals, the share of the two lowest quintiles rise from 13.5% in 1929 to 18% in the years after the Second World War, average of 1944, 46, 47, and 50, whereas the share of the top quintile declines from 55 to 44% and that of the top 5% from 31 to 20%. In the United Kingdom, the share of the top 5% of unit declines from 46% in 1880 to 43% in 1910 or 1913 or 33% in 1929 to 31% in 1938 and to 24% in 1947. The share of the lower 85% remains fairly constant between 19, uh, 1880 and 1913, between 41 and 43%, but then rises to 46% in 1929 and 55% in 1947. In Prussia, income inequality increases slightly between 1875 and 1913, the shares of the top quintile rising from 48 to 50 percent of the top 5 percent from 26 to 30 percent. The share of the lower 60 percent, however, remains above, about the same. In Saxony, the change between 1880 and 1913 is minor. The share of the two lowest quintiles declines 
from 15 to 14 and a half percent. That of the third quintile rises from 12 to 13 percent of the fourth quintile from 16 and a half to about 18 percent. That of the top quintile declines from 56 and a half percent to 54 and a half percent. And of the top 5% from 34 to 33%. In Germany, as a whole, relative income inequality drops fairly sharply from 1913 to the 1920s, apparently due to decimation of large fortunes and property incomes during the war and inflation, but then begins to return to pre-war levels during the depression of the uh, 1930s. Even for what we are, what they are assumed to represent, let alone as approximations to shares in distributions by secular income levels, the data are such that differences of two or three percentage points cannot be assigned significance. One must judge by the general weight and consensus of the evidence, which unfortunately is limited to a few countries, in justifies, it justifies a tentative impression of consistency in the relative distribution of income before taxes, followed by some narrowing of relative income inequality after the First World War or earlier. Three aspects of this finding should be stressed. First, the data are for income before direct taxes and exclude contributions by government, e.g. relief and free assistance. It is fair to argue that both the proportion and progressivity of direct taxes and the proportion of total income of individuals accounted for by government assistance to the less privileged economic groups have grown during recent decades. This is certainly true of the United States and the United Kingdom, but in the case of Germany is subject to further examination. It follows that the distribution of income after direct taxes and including free contributions by government would show an even greater narrowing of inequality in, uh, inequality in developed countries with size distributions of pre-tax ex-government benefits income similar to those for United States and the United Kingdom. Second, such stability or reduction in the inequality of the percentage shares was accompanied by significant rises in real income per capita. The countries now classified as developed have enjoyed rising per capita incomes except during catastrophic periods such as years of active world conflict. Hence, if the shares of groups classified by their annual income position can be viewed as approximations to shares of group classified groups classified by their secular income levels a constant percentage share of a given group means that it is per capita real income is rising at the same rate as the average of all units in the country and a reduction in inequality of the shares means that the per capita income of the lower income groups is rising at a more rapid rate than the per capita income of the upper income groups. The third point can be put in the form of a question. Do the distributions by annual incomes properly reflect trends in distribution by secular incomes. As technology and economic performance rise to higher levels, incomes are less subject to transient disturbances, not necessarily of the cyclical order that can be recognized by uh, recognized and allowed for by reference to business cycle chronology, 
but to a more irregular type. If in the earlier years, the economic fortunes of units were subject to greater vicissitudes, pure, poor grew, crops, poor crops for some farmers, natural calamity losses for some non-farm business units. If the overall pro proportion of in individual entrepreneurs whose incomes were subject to such calamities more yesterday, but some even today was larger in earlier decades. These earlier distributions of income would be more affected by transient disturbances. In these earlier disturb distributions, the temporary, temporarily unfortunate might crowd the lower quintiles and depress their shares unduly and the temporary fortune might for, uh, dominate the top quintile and raise its share unduly. Proportionately more than in the distributions for later years. If so, distributions by lower ter longer term average incomes might show less reduction in inequality than do the distributions by annual incomes. They might even show an opposite trend. One may doubt whether this qualification would upset a narrowing of inequality as market by, as that for the United States and in as short a period as 25 years. Nor is it likely to affect the persistent downward drift in the spread of the distributions in the United Kingdom. But I must admit a strong element of judgment in deciding how far this qualification modifies the finding of long-term stability followed by reduction in income inequality in the few developed countries for which it is observed or is likely to be revealed by existing data. The important point is that the qualification is relevant it suggests need for further study if we are to learn much from the available data concerning the secular income structure. And such study is likely to yield results of interest in themselves in their bearing upon the problem of trends in temporal instability of income flows to individual units or to in, uh, economically significant groups of units in different sectors of the national economy. The rest of the paper you can read in the URL I provided below. Thank you for listening.